Hello, hello everyone and welcome back to the VUCA Insights Podcast where we bring you uh, insights into the world of investing, entrepreneurship and growth mindset. Today we have a returning guest, uh, one of my favourite guests uh, because uh, I've never seemed to have an opportunity to have him do a face-to-face. -face. So I, I really got to nail him down to do a face-to-face -face podcast whenever he's in Malaysia, right? So my guest today is none other than Leonid Miranov. He's currently Head of Materials and Natural Resources at Pakat Capital Management. So um, what? How, how is the uh, English weather treating you right now, Leonid? John, first of all, thank you very much for having me back. I love being on your show, as you know, and uh, I, uh, here is a promise. I will definitely make my way over to Malaysia in uh, 2024 so we can actually do uh, that face-to-face um, -face recording. Um, the English weather, well, English, as usual, right? I mean, it's cold. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, thinking of warm Malaysian uh, evenings uh, is what keeps me going. Uh, okay, yeah. Have you taken a liking to durian already? Oh yeah, you know it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, the smell is still a bit rough, but uh, you know, <laughs> uh, the taste is great, right? The taste uh, is great, yeah. <laughs> okay, so today's episode, we're gonna focus. So, uh, Leo's expertise is really around commodities, precious metal, and all that, and even palm oil. You know, we did one episode mm. on palm oil. So if you remember that episode, we can check it out. Uh, if you don't remember that episode, you can check it out in the links below. So today, I'm going to pick Leo's brain on the commodities market. And I'm going to start with something a little bit more broad-based to the audience. So maybe, Leo, can you take us through what is the commodities market and why is it important? Well, you got to understand that everything around us is... Uh, built of something, right? It's done, it's made out of something, whether it's something very high techy like a phone, whether it's something very robust like a house, right? All, all of it is built out of something, is made out of something, right? And in the process of uh, growing something or mm, mining something or extracting something out of the ground, you face with the fact that it takes a very long time uh, to deliver a project that will produce these things. So like a mine takes up to 15 years to build, right? A, um, an agricultural facility takes a couple of years to properly set up and level out, uh, you know, like a plantation uh, or something. Um, and in that environment, you're taking the price risk. What if by the time you're up and running, you, you know, the thing you're trying to make is not going to be needed by anyone, right? Or even much more short term, if you are a farmer, um, you have uh, the crop, plan for the year and you're thinking you're going to, you know, uh, produce so many tons of palm oil this year, what if price gets cut in half, right? And uh, it's a natural need for people to secure a certain return on their investment over a period of time that drives them to uh, investors, right? They would want to pre-sell as much of their output as they feel necessary to make the project worthwhile or to take a degree of financial risk away from the project. And um, this has started happening in ancient times, right? Mm. As Mesopotamia, Egypt, they had, uh, I mean, they had a fairly vibrant um, non-spot delivery market, right? Where you make an agreement that you will deliver something at a certain date as opposed to trade over the counter, right? Uh, and then it, it kind of developed uh, from there, right? And um, the way uh, the modern markets developed is that not only did we uh, enable the farmers to sell their produce ahead, we also enabled investors to take risk in the market. So, for example, mm. even if you're of a, you know, a commodity uh, or um, even if you are not in any way related to the commodity in question, you can still take a position. So, for example, if you think that oil is no longer needed or that natural gas is not going to be burned this winter or something like that, you don't need to be a natural gas producer or a bank. You can just log on to your trading account and, uh, you know, buy or sell a future or an option um, contract and express your view in that way. So at this point in time, majority of trading in uh, commodity uh, products are not actually deliverable, i.e. there is no physical commodity exchanging hands at the end of the transaction, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a transaction where somebody goes long and somebody goes short and it's netted out over the course of, uh, you know, at the time of the contract rolling and 
the losing side pays the winning side effectively the difference sort of kind of yeah. broadly speaking yeah. um now of course it's not like that nobody you know gets together to, to, to sort it out but <laughs> the only impact on life that it has is uh the pnl right and uh but within that, there is still a very vibrant trade in actual commodities too, right? So there is the financial side of the market that is much, much bigger, but also the physical delivery side of the market that is much smaller and actually less dependent on exchanges these days um, in some commodities, more in some others. But um, more generally, a factor within these um, actual physical delivered markets is the fact that there are lots of long-term arrangements, long-term agreements between uh, producers and their consumers. In fact, mm. uh, offtake agreements tend to exist where a consumer commits to purchasing from the producer for a very long time, which if you think about it, serves exactly the same purpose as a long, and in a way it kind of is a long future contract, right? I mean, you have yeah. a contract in place to sell a certain amount at a certain price, either formula or a fixed price, um, that enables you to be comfortable that this mine will pay for itself over the long over the long haul. So um, that's roughly the structure as, as we look at it uh, today. But of course, it is de de depending on commodities, right? I mean, obviously, the uh, size of the market and the intensity of trading differs very much. Um, and also it depends obviously on the country. So for example, uh, most of the large commodity markets are in London or in America, mm -hmm. uh, um, but neither UK nor the US are big commodity users, right? And so uh, the biggest commodity user is of course China, um, and China also has a fairly vibrant uh, commodity market. But the, the, the thing that gets me every time is that if you look at the commodities that get traded on the Chinese exchanges, they're much more practical, right? I mean, so things mm. that uh, make top of the volume lists in China are things like soda ash or glass and things like that, right? Oh, Something no. you don't ever hear of in uh, London or America. Like Whereas here oh, we're see. dealing with... Um, whereas here we're dealing, and of course, like trading in gold and in oil is also big in China, coal, of course, iron ore, things like that, rebar. But th these are all from a practical angle, right? These are not necessarily investment products, or at least didn't stand off as investment products, but are really practical things that buyers and sellers um, deliver to one another. Now, there's obviously a speculative component to it and a big one, but uh, nevertheless, it's a speculative component in things that you don't normally speculate in if you are in the West. Uh, I understand. Yeah. It's interesting you brought that up, that insight up about practical, because you know, soda ash, you know, I wouldn't think that there was, I actually just knew that it's now that you told me there's a, there's actually a commodities market for uh, something that is of very practical industrial mm -hmm. usage because, you know, as a growing uh, economy in China where, where they need a lot of construction uh, activities going on, and they, that, that's where I think that's what you meant by practicality. Lah. So long to short, it's actually from the supplier's perspective, it's like, a hitch for them to ensure someone off takes but okay. for the same time as the buyer's perspective the commodities market exists is because they want to somewhat hitch uh, future supplies and future prices so in a way yeah. mutually beneficial to both parties right and like yeah. what you said there is always a speculative aspect to it am i correct for sure and the speculative aspect has grown over time okay okay Cool. So now as a retail investor and most, uh, and then, um, I mean, a majority of us are not in from the high finance markets. As a retail investor, I mean, would you in, invest? Because you see, there's a lot of headline news, you know, uh, Leo, it says, oh, go is all time high, whatever. So hmm. to, the, to, the, to the reader, how should he or she, uh, who, are, who are not commodity traders or professional traders themselves, should they invest in the commodity itself, i.e. the futures market, or should they more practically be investing in the companies that are involved in the value chain of a commodity, uh, from, your, from your perspective? Well, I think this is obviously very subjective, because on the one hand, it is much easier to buy a share of stock in a, in a mining company, right? I mean, from a pra practical view for any given individual, it's yeah. if you are investor already, or even if you're an aspiring investor, uh, the easiest thing to get into is stock trading, right? So for sure, 
um, you know, there is much less risk. You buy a share of stock in a company, um, and if it's a reputable company that's been around for a while, you're probably are not going to lose all. You're not going to lose all your money, right? And uh, whereas the uh, futures trading involves a much greater degree of risk, right? Um, but th these are market mechanics, though, right? I think it's also important to consider the uh, underlying dynamic of what it is that you're buying. Because when you're buying a commodity, say, a gold bar, right? Uh, or a, a gold contract, the contract is changes uh, price daily, the gold bar well, I mean, it probably does, but you don't really care. You have it lying around the house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to go anywhere or do anything, right? Um, all, at the same time, um, the gold bar or the gold contract that you have is an expression of just that, the price of gold. Whereas a price of a mining company is determined by more than just gold. Right? Mm. Because a mining company is in effect um a process of extracting that particular commodity out of the ground and of course when the commodity price is high it tends to pay for all the mistakes and all the costs uh, that you incur along the way uh which is fine but that that level of price might not be high enough to compensate for all your historical costs or even um at no point do you think that the margin that a gold company is making in a great period for gold prices is not necessarily sustainable but is fixed right it might get better mm -hmm. it might get worse and i think that's the really important part uh, yeah. the commodity producers businesses aren't a stable thing like the volumes might be stable the process might be stable but the economic implication of that process is not right mm. because if you think about it what goes into producing a commodity it's uh labor yep. it's energy and it's capital mm -hmm. equipment right that's uh, right capital equipment you pay once and you sort of depreciate over time but the other two are very uh, very flexible so for example if your labor uh pool all of a sudden demands high wages well you know what you're going to pay those high wages right um if energy prices are going up you will pay those higher energy prices so in a way you can think about a mining company as a company that is short labor and energy and is long uh the final product of that mine say gold bullion right yeah and it's more complicated dynamic than just gold up miners up right yeah um, it, yeah it's definitely that not that simple <laughs> not that simple at all and then on the flip side, consider why people buy commodities, right? Which is one for industrial use, like you were saying, for construction, for making stuff. Because of course, China makes all the stuff, right? So uh, I find it quite funny. People talk about how China's carbon emissions are so high and like, what are they doing? Well, they're making all your stuff. Of course, they're, they're, carbon they're, they're high. shouldering your responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, in, in you know so when you buy a commodity you can either buy it to make something with it or you can buy it for investment purposes right i mean you buy it to keep it to presumably sell on at a higher price at a later stage and um, that driver of that investment mindset especially this is especially prevalent in gold where there are multiple reasons for why people do it like they believe that the monetary system is count coming to an end they think mm -hmm. that their currency they feel like um, their currency controls are getting too tight, right? I mean, all these things are not exactly um, market-driven in a way, right? I mean, they kind of are, but it's a more complicated set of um, parameters that you have to consider in that case. And we can do, you know, a separate episode on that if there's interest. But uh, the long and short of it is the reasons why people buy uh, the commodities are varied and they're not mm. necessarily linked to the ability of the mines to produce uh, the metal mm. or other commodity so in a way you can see that uh, the drivers of trades can sometimes diverge very dramatically now that's not to say that they always do and if you take uh, a, a good way to look at it is compare gld uh, the gold etf in america versus mm. gd the gold mining etf in america and you'll see that gld tends to outperform gdx 
um, or even over long periods of time. But then there are periods of time when they trade in sync. Those period, but it's you know, which makes it more complicated still that you don't exactly know what period are you going through this very moment. Are you going through a period? <laughs> miners follow gold or you're you going through a period when they're not so incidentally right now we're going through a period when miners are not following gold right i mean gold is uh, knocking on all-time highs it had an all-time high recently actually uh yeah. miners are away from their all-time highs right <laughs> uh, it, 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 per perhaps i think miners also has the esg thing going against them probably that that's one of the reasons why I can think of it, you know, possible reasons compared to the past. Am I, I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, again, think of mining as this mechanism, right? You put people, yeah. you put and you put capital equipment in and plop on the other end, the piece of gold comes out, right? Yep. That also produces, like you say, all sorts of environmental, um, well, uh, I'm not going to call it damage outright, but there is yeah. an environmental impact that happens right. from that process. Right, and it's not just directly from that process. It's also from shipping things in, flying people in, shipping right. the gold in and out. All these things have an environmental impact. And if they have to pay for all that, right, all of a sudden you're like, okay, uh, how much, right? And you can really <laughs> go, go, go down the rabbit hole there, and you can really make up some crazy numbers at, as to how much gold should be mm. commodities, right? If you start factoring in all the they're called scope three emissions so yes uh, and once you start trying to put a number of them you're start you're starting to be responsible for the emissions of your customers yes and then, like once you attach a carbon value to this st stuff right i mean it does tend to push um these break-even numbers for miners to ridiculous levels so you know i, I feel like esg definitely has like um this general impact where people are concerned about it and they're trying to kind of figure out how to value it and price it. But I think uh, more pertinently, perhaps, is that um, the, the ESG movement has put a dampener on energy availability in particular um, relative to what it could have been and higher energy prices uh, and higher labor prices meant that the cost of production has increased very substantially, whereas yeah finished product prices have gone up, but not enough to offset it. So um, you look and look at uh, margins of uh, producers, yeah, which is uh, quite informative. And uh, as um, like even or, or things like an ROE, like return on equity of uh, listed mm -hmm. companies, yes. it's an yes. easily available metric. And you will yeah. see that company ROEs are well below where they were in 2020 or 2018 or 19. Right. Yeah. So now to have them in like, I'm looking because, uh, you know, I'm fo focusing on Asia myself. Um, yeah. I look at Asian companies a lot more. So and, um, you know, like at, at the moment, uh, ROEs in the high teens are, you know, rare and more <laughs> lo low teens and even single digit ROEs. Whereas in yeah. 2020, you had 30, 40 percent ROEs. Uh, yeah. Uh, my, our ROE, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're using it as a shorthand for margin here. I mean, it's yeah. not uh, not the not it's not perfect. Yeah, yeah it's not, not perfect, perfect I, but r it tells you roughly, roughly the right. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm actually looking at the BHP group on my screen right now, and I'm like a bit surprised because while you were like explaining this now, I was like, my God, the gross has grown uh, gone up. But again, BHP is not a very good indicator because while they do gold, they do a lot of other things like you know, yeah, um, a lot of BHP. Other yeah. BHP obviously is a big iron ore producer, and iron ore has yeah. been one of the stronger uh, energy markets, sorry, uh, commodity markets. Um, yeah. Not without its challenges, but for sure, uh, people have been talking about the demise of iron ore and the end of the iron ore run and all that stuff, and it just hasn't happened, right? <laughs> uh, so, and also the economics of something like iron ore, right, at a good mine. Um, are so good at these prices, uh, right? So you, you think like the cash cost of extraction is low teens, or maybe high teens in dollars, right? Mm. And for metric ton, right? Pure pure extraction, right? And then on top yeah. of it, you pull some transportation costs, 
you know, um, some sort of de depreciation and all that stuff. But really, uh, once on the boat, you're talking about like 30 to 40 bucks uh, of uh, cost to BHP. And you sell it in China for 150, 130, 140, up to 200 at some point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a good business, man, right? Yeah, uh, it is. It is. <laughs> but you look at gold, for example, and the all-in sustaining cost on a lot of these miners is um, around 2,000, right? Uh, around yeah. 2,000 Australian uh, dollars, uh, which, you know, still leaves you with a margin. And um, now, I mean, obviously, 2,000 Australian is not for everyone, right? I mean, there are yeah. people who... Are relatively lower costs, but it's not uncommon to see, right? So um, th that to me indicates that uh, at this gold price, they're not, it's like being a gold miner is not as good as business as it might uh, appear, right? I mean, mm -hmm. think literally printing money, but you're not, right? I mean, it's still just a business with a product where you don't control the price and you can't raise the price just because your cost's gone up, right? You're yeah. in a, like the, the, the downside of every commodity business is that you're a price taker for your output and there's nothing Correct. you can do uh, to you're, move the You're price. not got to be able to manipulate those prices. <laughs> exactly. And you yeah. also, you can't control how much of the same commodity will other people find and how mm. happy they will be to waste spend money on developing all these projects and what happens that if at some point um you know there's just this big glut of uh, this product on the market that then make sure that those who are not in a strong financial position have to close their production right and that's how a commodity cycle is born right um yeah. the commodity that stands out again here is gold because um we've never really had a significant uh supply glut per se right and because uh, as we were saying earlier, the uh, thing that drove a lot of that drives a lot of uh, gold purchases is not necessarily driven by gold availability coming out of the mines, but rather um, people's perception of inflation risk, of uh, currency risk, and things like that. Right, um, and when that fear factor is high, right, I mm. mean, tend to buy more gold, and again. That, that, that kind of means that the gold cycle is driven by uh, things other than the economics of mining, right? Yeah. And that, that that is the reason why you can have things out of whack, right, in terms of mining performance and 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 metal pricing. Yeah, I, I'm I'm glad. Okay, there's so many layers to peel, so I'm gonna just uh, probably take one one at a time. One one was actually what you've uh, raised quite eloquently about. Uh, mining costs, looking at it as a business, and then obviously because you you put um, capex resources, you put labor, and pop comes out like you know one one mine item. But again, when you come from when you look at labor, because la labor is a bit of a, a, a tricky thing. You you go to countries where labor labor unions are very strong. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, inflation of costs is going to be a big headache for you. You know, the strikes and all that kind of thing. But on the other end of the spectrum, where you go to countries that are, have less strict or less stringent labor laws, then there is a fear of you know labor abuse, uh, child labor, child mining, and all that kind of thing. And this is where ESG will hit them hard, you know, uh, uh, blockade, uh, boycotts, and all that kind of thing. So labor is always this tricky thing and this tricky nuance. The second thing that the second nuance I want I like to point out is that you talked about. Um, return on equity for a lot of these gold miners and you said that the fixed cost has not really come down. Now, I want to peel a little bit deeper into that because in terms of mining technology, in terms of capex costs, hasn't um, you know new methods, new chemicals or new technology actually really brought that down or do you think that is like it's not changed much over the past what 20, 30 years kind of kind of mining from, from your knowledge actually? No. Uh... <laughs> So the costs have gone up fairly steadily over um, the past couple of years, uh, mm. in fact, decades, uh, and with it, the gold price, right? So it was, mm. um, if you think back to like early 2000s, gold price was in the 200s, right? So it's effectively yeah. uh, the next since then, right? Mm. Um, or three, three more like, but, you know. Um, the um, gold production cost has similarly had a, a very rapid move, move up. Um, 
this is happening despite improvements in technology. This is happening despite mm. improvements. Uh, because again, the question fundamentally is about what is the technology addressing? And the technology tends to address the grade. That is to say that you can extract more even at lower mm. grades. But mm. lower grade extraction, by definition almost, leads to higher costs, right? So like, uh, you, uh, like you, you, you should think it through, right? I mean, as you have less and less metal per, per square uh, meter or, or cubed meter of material, you have to work through that material. And earth right. moving is just, it's energy uh, inefficient, right? I mean, moving... Yeah, yeah. Earth around takes effort, takes diesel or, uh, well, mostly diesel, right? And uh, although some people are trying solar uh, at the moment, right? So you, that's just a given, as you need to move more material around, uh, no matter which form or which shape, it will uh, result in higher energy costs. And obviously with energy costs also going up, uh, again, going back to the idea that you're actually short energy as a gold producer or... Yeah. You need uh, any kind of mined uh, 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 techniques or mining techniques or mining methodologies, right? Yeah. The, the next one I want to peel a little bit deeper, which you, you said earlier as well, is like sometimes the supply and demand is not due to an industrial need, but more of, you know, emotional or psychological factors such as uh, people fear, let's just say, because, you know, usually when there is a war, when there was a breakout of the war, the Russian-Ukraine war, and then now mm. uh, the war in Gaza, right? Um, gold prices tend to take a spike because, like, people fear about currency devaluation and, you know, inflationary concerns. And it doesn't help that, you know, even with rising interest rates in the U.S., uh, there is still inflationary concerns in the U.S. And, you know, that, that plays on the fear. So, how does it exacerbate? In, in a sense, maybe my question would be, is it because there is now so much or so easily available futures contracts or things like this, that's why there is such volatile movement of the prices of gold because of this? Because the, 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 the mechanics of the tools are easier for people to access. Is, is that the reason why? Or and I, is, I, I think that's part of it, but I think also it's important to understand that uh, the nature of the market participants has also evolved over time, right? And mm -hmm. we now have a large number of uh, automated algorithmic trading uh, companies that are big participants in these commodity futures markets, right? I mean, somebody mm -hmm. shared at the point a couple of weeks ago that in the oil market, for example, the number of algorithmic participants has gone up from like 30-40% to over 60% this year, right? Wow. Uh, now, is this a long-term thing? Maybe. Uh, is this good? Is it bad? Is it driving the price up or down? Debatable, right? And uh, we can have a chat about that. But realistically speaking, it's just different, right? It means, uh, the question is, does it make it harder or easier for the market to, to, to trend up or down? And I think right now it's clear that it's certainly not helping any of the commodities. As of right now, we're certainly um, seeing the fact that uh, the current market structure is not conducive to things going up now. Mm. The market structure can do whatever it likes if the fundamentals are strong enough market structure be damned right uh the things will go up but what are fundamentals in something something like gold right i mean you're saying um war in ukraine or war in gaza right uh we should all buy gold should we i <laughs> mean like, i think that's a, a genuine question and i don't mean to be uh, disrespectful to those who think that we should. Maybe we should. I don't have the right answer. I don't think there is a right answer. I think for more and more people, the answer is not an automatic yes, right? I think maybe mm, the argument for gold over the years has been that, look, for thousands and thousands of years, gold's been this great store of value. And look, like Romans, uh, Roman army salary. Uh, 40 ounces of gold a year and like American army the salary is like 55 grand a year exactly the same number it's uh, you know look there is no inflation in gold and all that stuff right and, yeah I mean I guess right but 
uh, you know, this um, gold has been the basis of our monetary system. Yeah, but it also hasn't been, right? And, yeah. we, you know, when we talk about fiat and how it's not great. Yeah, I mean, it's, but it's not bad or uh, that gold is good. It's just these are different, right? I mean, the flexibility of a fiat system is really quite useful. Uh, especially, you know, to economists. <laughs> um, <laughs> this idea of having a unit of exchange, uh, this gold bar, that will definitely not lose its purchasing power of time is quite appealing, unless you also think about the fact that it's not yielding anything, it's not bringing you anything, right? I mean, it's just lying around there, and you kind of, again, are hoping that this relationship is gonna um stay true and then they invent this bitcoin thing right uh which you know some people are referring as digital gold it's not but some people are saying that um and you're like okay well is that bitcoin taking up um you know uh the market share uh, of gold for these people who are preparing for the event right uh for like a currency debasement or the end of the monetary system right like, well I mean, I don't know. I'm not really in those circles, but I think the answer is probably yes, right? Because, yeah. you know, you are thinking that this thing is going to have value even if my dollar holdings are going to uh, get, get devalued over time. And I think the, the, the story behind all these things is so interesting and so intricate and so appealing, especially if somebody's telling it with this aplomb and you know the, the, the gold bugs can really sort of put the fear of god into you right i, mean, yeah. you know, everything there, I like the way you put it fear of god yeah. uh, it's it, no but uh, i mean we, we've all seen the presentations we've been to you know meetings and seminars and uh, presentations and whatnot and um and for my money if anything, I think we're discovering that there is more to it than just uh, not losing value over time, right? I mean, the opportunity cost of not um, investing into enterprise, right? I mean, uh, is it, it, quite substantial. And it's yes, not sir. clear that even... In a, so, um, uh, I was having this discussion with, uh, with, with, with my cousin recently, and uh, he runs um, a fund here in London, uh, and uh, we we're talking about it, right? I mean, can you be very long, like equities, but actually be really bearish, right? And um, and the answer is yes, right? Because there are other products that um, are not strictly speaking correlated to the broader market that actually work pretty well in a challenging uh, broad market environment. And to be fair, we're not going for a challenging broad market environment. Look, yeah, yeah. yeah thing is up i mean unless you're in china like you know like me yeah. uh but uh, um you know uh ev everything else is going up and you're like well okay but apparently this is the end times right and, and they're just not and that then tends to be the case of the years that yes there is a degree of mismanagement of the public purse in most countries right i yeah. mean nobody does that outside of maybe switzerland and arguably singapore right i mean yeah. uh there is generally public purse mismanagement and this tends to over time lead to inflation and that inflation tends to raise prices for pretty much everything is kind of is the difference um and in that environment gold does give you protection but mm. it seems to me that um equity investments tend to do as well if not better quite frequently right uh, again not broad market investing, but you can find uh, equities that do really well in these inflationary environments. But also, more generally, betting on uh, a good outcome has been the right thing to have done over the course of um, the past I own 100 years now, right? I mean, yeah, that's not, exactly. to say, that's not to say it's going to continue, but yeah. um, the the attractiveness so, sorry this is a very long-winded answer to your uh, very good I question understand. yeah the gold right if you consider all these things if you really sort of uh, drill down on this i think the market share of people who are uh trading gold as as a defensive asset uh against currency debasement and economic mal malfeasance and mismanagement is 
relatively smaller than the portion of people, not even people, machines that traded as just bits on screen up and down for whatever reason, because the formula says so, right? Mm -hmm. And in this environment, yes, for sure, if there's an outright panic about uh, where the dollar is headed, right? I mean, if we will uh, be faced with like a big fiscal expansion in the US, right? With Without the corresponding increase in taxation or whatever, right? I mean, yes. Um, the, the, there is, of course, a strong inflationary impulse that is likely to support the gold price. But um, as things stand, all right, we, we we're not quite there yet. And you know, I, and a lot of people are saying we will get there. We'll definitely get there. We're on our way. And maybe, right? I mean, but today, you know, we, we're actually dealing with an you know an environment where. Uh, Everything is, is acting as you kind of would expect it to, and this just doesn't create enough panic for that um, small group of people to grow to be a large group of people to outweigh the uh, algorithms. And of course, once they start getting bigger, the algorithms are going to turn and they're going to drive price in the same direction. And that's when you have these big sort of runs and jumps in, in, in the price of underlying commodity. But we're not uh, quite there yet, uh, and 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 so um that's why you just don't have the spikes as you probably would have expected yeah yeah uh, interesting uh you know uh, answer uh to to that uh, probability thinking about you know why why people buy go outside of his industrial use um just one more final uh, question on that particular theme about maybe i start out with this comment you know the guys the the big you know, macro guys like the Ray Dalios of this world and all, all these big macro guys. It, it, it's very tempting because, you know, uh, ah, I found my word, doomsday cults, you know, mm. doomsday cults, right? So, you know, people talk about gold, people talk about silver, you know, as, you know, a, a alternative currency replacement. I mean, like, if I were in the shoes of a non-expert, but I hear a lot of this story sell, you know, doomsday cult, Ray Dalio talking about, you know, old weather portfolio. How should I discern my thought process and how should I channel that action in a way? Because right now, <clears throat> what you're saying is, based on your earlier answer, is that over time, gold has not proven to be a very great asset class. I mean, equity, I mean, if you look at the data, you and I know that, you know, equities trump a lot of things, real estate, you know, even fine wine and, and precious metals and all that. But it doesn't help that, you know, the headline news is keep continuously blaring, you know, you know, buy gold, inflationary measure, you know, Bitcoin, digital gold replacement, all these things that supposedly make gold inflationary proof, uh, uh, um, government malfeasance is going to uh, overcome that. How do I discern this? What are the probably the questions you would ask yourself to, you know, help temper that either enthusiasm or pessimism towards gold as, a, as an asset class? Well, um, <laughs> I think that, 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 that's a very, very good question overall, right? I think I would like to start by saying that first, be very careful with things like over the long run or like this outperforms that over the long run, right? I mean, mm. people have made careers out of overfitting data, right? And out of uh, picking out um, exact data points that really make a point, right? So for example, right, if you take uh, gold returns since like 1972, right, or uh, the, the end of um, gold window, all of a sudden you capture the big spike once the window gets open, right, and all of a yep. sudden gold looks tremendous, right, but yep. then you take, yep. you add on another 50 years where it did nothing because it was controlled, right, it yep. doesn't look so good anymore, right, and uh, it's actually quite an important um, uh, thing to be aware of, like all these long-term dynamics you have to be aware of them, like you do, right? I mean, whatever the 50-year performance number is for a commodity or an asset class, you've got to be aware of it, but also be aware that you're not going to get it, right? Whatever that <laughs> average is, what you will have, right? I mean, this is a good... Um, because again, right, I mean, it's just one data point and you have returns every day that, you know, go, uh, and they accumulate and you go in at a certain time and, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 how much worse a strategy performance is if you take away its test best, the 10 best days a year, right? I mean, mm, it destroys mm. 5 or 70% of performance uh, or, or at least alpha, right? Uh, okay. 
uh, but these are just 10 days out of 300 to 70 uh, trading days. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is, right? I mean, even five, the missing your five best trading days already has a massive uh, oversized impact on most things. So uh, just go, go to bear that in mind. And so with gold, I actually think that it almost acts as a comfort blanket, right? If mm. you are a narrative around gold, which you know, we, we all are, and to be fair, right? I mean, let's also put it on the table. It has moved up over the years, right? I mean, you can't uh, ignore that, right? So uh, there is an aspect to it of, let's just put it here. And uh, as long as gold remains near or, you know, it still remains a uh, tier one asset, right? I mean, for banks and uh, central banks, right? As long as that's the case, gold is likely to be there or thereabouts when inflation comes, right? I mean, if inflation periods start, and I happen to think that over the next 10 years, inflation is going to be elevated relative to what it has been uh, for the prior 10 years, right? So um, in this environment, gold for sure is something that you need to keep an eye out on. The question is, when do you buy? Do you buy it mm. as it starts moving? Do you buy the miners if they lag it? Do you buy physical and just keep it, you know, in your room or something? Uh, that depends on your personal uh, ability to handle risk, degree of your involvement in the market, and also your comfort, right? If owning 10% in gold will give you additional comfort, well, who am I to stop you? You know, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> but by the 10%, right? If this is something that gives you comfort, maybe it makes you a better investor elsewhere, right? I mean, just the fact that you feel more comfortable, you don't feel like you need to, you know, swing at every pitch, right? I mean, maybe it gives you the opportunity to uh, temper your uh, approach to other things, right? You don't need to reach for this, that, and the other when you know that, you know, there's this 10% comfort blanket of gold that you'll never lose it. It's not going to go down in value. It's always going to be there. It's going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just more often like gold has not had a bad year, right? I mean, uh, in fact, gold had a pretty good year of the uh, this year. Um, but it doesn't feel like it. And I, and I think uh, for a lot of um, bullion investors in particular, right? I mean, they, they, they tend to um, they tend to be quite prickly about it and like you know yeah. and, and, uh, <laughs> uh, yes uh, the pushback i get quite a lot from people who own physical bullion is that i don't get it and that i somehow don't see it and i'd like to tell everybody i do see it i do get it i understand fully what you're saying what i'm saying <laughs> is my view on the timing is different to yours i would not rather buy now and hold forever and not worry about it um but rather I would incorporate gold in my uh, trading strategy, in my own um, indicators that I'm looking at. And at some point there will be where, where it is clearly worthwhile to go all in on the maybe, mm. but that time will not come, right? Mm. And uh, if we are back to a deflationary world, that is, uh, because the crux of the matter, still the crux of the matter for gold investing is inflation, right? Mm. And inflation's, enemy is dead right you, you, <laughs> it, it, it's a little bit counterintuitive but the more debt load exists in the system the harder it is to attain growth rates right and i, yeah. I think histor historically what we've done with it is inflated the debt away right and that's where the, the gold performances come from but of course the one of the driving factors for the ability to inflate the debt away is growing population and growing productivity, right? I mean, with growing population and productivity, it's much easier to uh, inflate things away. As global population starts to level off, th this idea of inflating the debt becomes a lot more dangerous, right? And mm -hmm. in that sense, you can say, well, it only makes a stronger case for gold, right? I mean, let's be prepared, which is fine. Maybe that's the way to approach it. Maybe be prepared. But my thinking is, the uh, policymakers uh, on most levels, there might not be the most, you know, um, proactive people in terms of explaining their views, but they're fully aware of everything that you're aware of, right? I mean, <laughs> do not think that uh, central bank um, governors 
do not understand the intricacies of this argument. They might not believe it, they might not buy into it, and they might be a little bit cavalier with, you know, with the rates and whatnot, but they're fully aware of the underlying possibilities. So my view on all of this is, and with Jay Powell has, has actually kind of demonstrated, and I think will continue to demonstrate, that their approach to inflation is quite serious, and they will not let it happen easily, and this... Mm. The, uh, there will be a point at which we will clearly see if we're going to a inflationary world or a deflationary world. And if we are heading down the inflation path, um, that will be the time. That will be the time to own gold and that will be the time to own a lot of gold, right? Yep. Uh, but for as long as the pathway is not entirely clear, and some people say it's already clear. Some people say that it's, you know there's only one way to go. But consider the opposite. If inflation never materializes to the correct to to to, to sufficient degree, and okay, we have a slightly elevated, like I don't know, like three percent, three and a half percent inflation, you know, uh, going forward. If um, the debt load is just too high, right? And the debt load is what's going to be this massive dampener on growth, and we're mm. going to be in like really unpleasant situation with low nominal growth uh, where inflation is most of that nominal growth. The real growth is low or zero or whatever. And it can just stagnate for quite a long time, right? And that environment is going to be terrible for gold, right? And then yeah. um, uh, that, and it, because again, in that environment, th things that uh, yield, uh, you know, come at a premium. Whereas of course, gold does not uh, Correct. do anything. And yeah. then it, it just, it's uh, it's uh, it, it it's not a it's not a particularly um, sort of the reason why things are not going up uh, ten percent every day is because it's not clear that they should right. Yeah. Uh, the market at the end of the day is fairly efficient. Now it doesn't yes. mean that market does everything right. It's just on yep. the it the balance of probabilities at, at that point in time, right? And I feel like in gold, in oil, it's all these things where I might not agree with what it's doing, but I can certainly tell you it's not unreasonable. And it's li literally that balance of probabilities as of 13th of December, 2023. That's right. That's right. No, I, I like it that you put it so eloquently that, you see, the, the thing is sometimes because of, I think, the manner in which someone has vested time to research to understand all this and then he, he or she cannot perceive that kind of logic and that's where the struggle is will be you, you may not agree but who are you to not agree the market you know <laughs> right uh, mm. here comes the next question and you know trying to, to to move on to to the next big thing so we've i think covered quite uh, uh quite broadly and also in depth about you know different reasons why price movement, supply, demand, um, non-industrial use of gold. But maybe coming to a more specific question on the value chain, um, maybe take us through um, broadly or maybe even specifically like companies or categories. So if you've got miners, you've mm -hmm. got guys in between, um, you've got like uh, markets in India where, you know, uh, it, it's a very big trading hub for gold, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, other, apart from China as well. Uh, and, and then all the way until the end consumer where India is definitely one of the largest when it comes to jewelry. So maybe take us through that value chain and, and who, so we've got miners and then you've got traders and anywhere in between. So maybe briefly on, on, on each of these categorizations. All right. Well, gold is a little bit... Um trickier than most mm -hmm. other commodities because um you just it's useless sort of <laughs> kind of right i mean uh I mean, it's not useless of course but if you think about it, like what do you do with it well you beautify things with it right i mean yeah uh, yeah you, you what about industrial it? use like semiconductor i mean it's a good conductor Some, I mean, it, yeah it's yeah. good but not uh you know it's too expensive uh to be you know worthwhile uh yeah. for any use but also we don't have enough of it for it to really become an industrial mantle mm -hmm. right i mean the, the volume that uh, of, of gold that we have and produce is not really big if you, if there is a great conductive use for gold right i mean like uh, people like uh wire it's like uh, the high-end music equipment right I yeah mean, the, the, the gold the, 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 cables you know all that yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, again i i i'm not a, a music guy so um 
I wouldn't be able to tell you, practically speaking, if it's any better or not. But what I can tell you is that if every wire had to have been made out of gold, we wouldn't have enough gold, right? So, <laughs> and that, uh, you know, probably means that, the, you know, if gold had industrial uses, it would probably settle at a much higher price. Um, now, actually, this is quite an interesting thing to, relating to silver, for example, because silver is finally, just, well, not finally, it's always been half precious, half industrial metal, but mm. now it's industrial use of silver in solar panels in particular mm. is, is going through the roof. So uh, it's quite interesting that maybe the next uh, big market in precious metals will be the industrial application of said precious metal in this case, silver. But that's yeah. uh, that's um, a slightly different chat. But in gold, right, you have, um, again, think of that box that we discussed, right? I mean, so you have yeah. to have people coming in, you have to have energy coming in, and you have to have uh, equipment, right? So the first chain uh, there is, of course, the equipment manufacturers. So your okay. commands, for example, they make, uh, they have this brand called Joy, uh, which is uh, long been uh, a, a good uh, uh, source of uh, producer. This is Komatsu of Japan, right? Commands of Japan, yes, but they own like a bunch of other things, right? Um, for, for underground mining equipment, right? And uh, um, the Mm, the main bulk of the value chain, though, are the uh, mining companies themselves, right? I mean, mm, they mm. produce it, uh, ship it, and uh, market it. Okay. In other commodities, you have uh, traders that take a bigger role uh, than uh, they do in gold. And gold miners are big players, right? I mean, ah. they do themselves there are of course trading activities and there are big traders but relative to say uh, although in oil it's also changing right i mean in oil i think everyone has now seen the value of have, having a big trading operation um yeah. so they're be, being built back up but um in 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 gold we do have uh, a situation where uh, miners have long-term relationships especially in the indian and chinese markets and you know there is this uh fairly well trodden path of shipping gold to you know either exchanges or or, or end users uh then there are of course exchanges right exchanges are big and there are uh, there is the london bullion um market where okay. You know, where you trade big bars of gold. There's COMEX and uh, the gold window in uh, America where you try trade smaller uh, gold mm -hmm. bars. Um, there are uh, Tokyo and Shanghai exchanges, which, are, which also do a good volume in gold. But of course, there's also yeah. Zurich that uh, is... Uh, that is also a very deep gold market, but uh, mm -hmm. Swiss gold market is not super transparent, right? Okay. Uh, mm, interesting. Um, so if you want, for example, a conspiracy theory, uh, the reason why gold didn't go up more over the course of 22, 23, and in fact, you would see these um, ramp ups in gold pricing that, that, that really would then get hit down. Uh, people believe that Swiss intermediaries have helped Russia sell its uh, gold to help fund the... Um, uh, to help fund the, uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, now, again, uh, this is just a theory, and uh, I yeah. obviously have no um, verifying it or, or, or indeed not verifying yeah. it. Uh, yeah. It does. It did seem like for the longest period of time we had this big seller who was not super price sensitive, right? And then a big volume of uh, the metal might have been shipped somewhere or uh, moved out from your own warehouse into an exchange warehouse and then sold off, right? Um, and uh, at a price where you didn't really care and then big volume would go through and you're like, huh, I wonder what happened there. And yeah. so <laughs> the con conspiracy theory is that, uh, well, I say conspiracy, a theory of what- uh, A theory, yeah. A theory of what happened there was this uh, Russian volume uh, being sold off on on, on, on the Zurich uh, gold. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So, um, so you've got again, miners, you've got the 
so you're saying that the minus itself because the volume may not be as big so you do not have somewhat of an equivalent of a traffic guru in the gold market is is that what i'm hearing you correctly yeah, or ba ba basically no there are there are there are traders who trade gold there are small and big traders there because the, the thing that you need to solve for gold is transportation right i mean because it's mm. high value um uh, high value stuff um there is also a fairly big market of small uh, operations shipping gold from the countries where it's getting mined in especially in africa to places mm. like dubai right so these people literally ship gold bullion in suitcases right I mean, wow. <laughs> um and it's like it's being used for all sorts of purposes right and again i don't want to smear anybody with you know accusations yeah. or whatever yeah, a lot yeah. of various stuff is being done uh that I'm way legitimate business is also done that way so it's yeah uh, um, so uh one ought to be you know on top of that now um there is obviously a big industry in india uh for gold uh, jewelry there is also a big industry in china uh, again you know your uh Chow Thai folk, Lok folk, all these things oh right? yeah uh, all Thai folk, yes <laughs> yeah. um where uh, you know you know that gold came from somewhere right and uh, <laughs> and uh, of course the um the in the, the investment demand in all of this is actually like if you think like how do you conceptualize investment demand in this dynamic because it's people who are buying your products is clearly demand they're not really mm. doing anything with it right i mean they're putting it in the vault like mm. is this really a good use of your product i mean maybe right and again given the conversation we just had about uh, the reasons for why people do it yeah okay fine like uh, go nuts kind of thing but um yeah. at the same time the investment demand is a significant portion of the overall um of the overall uh production so the thing about gold is that the gold that's been mined over the years didn't go anywhere it's still here more often than not right you can go to the british museum and look at all the ancient um shiny bits that they made out of gold back uh, in yesterday <laughs> yester civilizations right i mean uh, all the way all the way back people have been ma making uh, jewelry out of gold right and yeah. perhaps this is its uh, perception of value right um but all this gold is still around Right, so if you really needed to gold for something, you could probably smelt it and and, and use it again. Um, right. So, if gold, in a way, has this inbuilt inflation component that is mine production. Right, that rate mine, mine, mine production relative to overall gold supply kind of sort of provides you with this sort of uh, base level of inflation, which is, uh, if memory serves, around two percent. Right, and uh, you know. Okay. So, 2.7 or something right um so um the uh, the industry is very atypical relative to everybody else right so mm. uh, all other metals with greater degree of industrial usage uh, will have a much bigger trading component uh, mm -hmm. much bigger institutional uh, not institutional uh well yeah i suppose institutional but not a, yeah. not an investors but institutions that specialize in uh, trading that particular metal physically right Understand. in gold the, these things are a bit more uh, dispersed and a little bit more um uh, a little bit more maybe uh, quaint. Fragmented, uh, fragmented or quaint okay maybe yeah. on, on, on that point itself is there actually like a cartel you know i mean you did mention briefly about the swiss and the theory that they had about but mm. like opec opec's an oil cartel right uh, I, I i don't see i mean based on my reading i don't see like precious metals like palladium or what having a cartel itself but maybe is it because it's lumped together that you know the glencores of this world the bhps of this world they themselves already form a cartel and if there is and then do do do, do enlighten us is there something of an equivalent nature in gold itself and if there is well, is it good a bad thing well like consider the market structure always consider the market structure right uh, in iron ore you have two countries that produce the bulk of it right brazil and uh, australia. australia australia is is basically three producers um brazil is another producer 
I'm not saying that there is an agreement between the three of them or the four of them. Um, I'm not saying there is even regular sessions or touch base saying sessions of any kind. But all I'm saying is it's much harder for Chinese steelmakers to get together and have an impact on the price uh, than mm. it is for producers to get together mm. and, form a, uh, and push the buyers on the price. Um, at the same time, consider gold. Lots of small producers, right? I mean, uh, um, in industry is fragmented as hell, right? I mean, how can you possibly have a cartel in, in this environment, right? Uh, what's more, uh, and again, you might enjoy this, uh, there is this conspiracy theory, and this is definitely a conspiracy theory, uh, <laughs> that big banks, big bullion banks, uh, the banks with gold operations, uh, have been conspiring to keep the gold price down to benefit the uh, Federal Reserve or, you know, uh, the central banks, if you prefer, at large. Uh, and uh, their actions, you know, has been very successful in silver, not so successful in gold, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. Well, I mean, you know, it's what it is, right? People want people have a view of the world uh people take a position based on that view of the world if yeah. that position doesn't perform the way they thought it would even though their broader view of the world tends to be sort of um uh it seems to be checking out right i mean you're like well i thought this is gonna happen i thought they're gonna print all this money and they're gonna do all these things and it's gonna be terrible and it's gonna be horrible and gold's gonna go up and instead you have you know massive equity rally and google gold uh, doesn't go up nearly as much people tend to look for uh reasons uh for why that didn't happen and they tend to look outward for those reasons and therefore try to put blame on the secret cabal of bankers who are trying to keep it down, right? And that's not to say that the banks are blameless, right? I mean, there's yeah. been this case uh, of the uh, JP Morgan uh, gold dealers that uh, got done for market manipulation. But you got to understand that this manipulation we're talking about is like tens of dollars per ounce here or there uh, to benefit themselves personally, right? And over the long enough period of time and the big enough uh sort of trading volume you, you know you are um okay some people say it's not actually tens it's hundreds but yeah the principle stands right i mean that uh these were people who are ripping off their clients they're not working for the cabal right i mean so um the um the big important um factor in all of this is perception right and mm -hmm. your perception informs your ability to take signals from the market and uh, if you are very biased and we all are biased in our own ways but uh, if your bias is hard money bias i call it right i mean <laughs> Uh, if, you, if you feel more comfortable with the idea of hard money than you are with the idea of a flexible supply money right uh, mm. uh, um, you know, so the same data point can trigger you in a different way than, say, uh, like a growth investor uh, mindset would uh, mm, sort of lead you down a very different path. Is, is what I'm and, saying. Understood. Understood. So, so I guess in in a way, the essence is that perception will form whether you believe there is a cartel or not. And you've clearly gave some examples of some theories. Obviously, you know, we we can't mm. we can't fact check, validate, you know, that kind of thing. Um, to actually form a basis whether there's going to be a cartel and in a very fragmented industry like gold. Okay, great. I'm going to move on to uh, probably a little, a little bit of a different angle. So more back to what you said as well, which is the bulk of the supply chain, the value chain actually comes from the miners, even though they're fragmented a little. So if we were, and it's related to the question, if we were to invest in companies within the value chain rather than the commodity itself, right? Um, what are the challenges of these miners? Is it more of a replenishment? We know it's finite, <laughs> but you know, uh, someone came out with peak oil theory probably 20, 30 years ago, but is there a peak gold theory from, from, from your reading and from your... <laughs> yeah, and is that concern going forward, impacting so prices? In metals in general, we have seen a lowering of the grades over the past 20 years, mm -hmm. but it's um, sort of, it's uh, 
cup half full or half empty sort of thing. Yes, the growth grades are lowering, but they're also getting better at extracting at those low rates. And it's perhaps because we've gotten better at extracting that we're able to work these lower grades and therefore the average mm. grade, lower grade deposits all of a sudden are economically extractable, right? And then, mm. so how long is a piece of string, right? So kind, kind of thing, right? Uh, the um, thing to look out for for a lot of these guys are, are two things that are maybe a little bit non-intuitive because i mean again i remind you that in that box energy is a big input so all miners are short energy and which is mm. why like when energy had the big spike in 22 you had a big downdraft in a lot of the miners is because the input cost is going up the second thing is pro labor policies of any government tend mm. to elevate labor costs, which can be quite significant, um, especially if you're relying on um, cheap labor. Now, there aren't that many places that have cheap labor anymore. I mean, outside of a couple of places in Africa, but um, in, in in mining, right? Because you, you kind of, you, it's less human intensive, more uh, equipment intensive and, you know, right. uh, it, it makes sense to train up your people and once your people are trained they tend to receive higher salaries even in far-flung locations but you know there are still places you said uh, you know, you, children are sent to the mines well the uh, correct term is artisanal mining right so there mm. are places where mining is still a meaningful part of uh, um, you know the extractive industry there I'm thinking places like uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo but um, but of course, uh, you know, hopefully all these problems will be resolved as more and more global and mostly Chinese companies come in and uh, implement their high standards for uh, efficiency and uh, modern production processes. They're just a lot more efficient than the artisanal guys, right? And uh, mm. hopefully over time, you know, this will be done away with. But um, conceptually, pro-labor policies of any government tends to move up your cost base. Um, and the other thing that plays a big role is, of course, currency management, because mm. uh, think about it. Your costs are in your local domiciled currency, whereas your revenues are almost in dollars. So environment of a weak dollar um, versus your currency uh, actually squeezes you in the ways that you don't fully appreciate, right, until you start uh, signing the checks and, you know, <laughs> uh, and that, that um, in particular, you know, Aussie uh, US exchange rate, right? I mean, for a lot yeah. of uh, that's one thing to look out for. But yeah, we've, we've gone through a period of fairly low exchange rate volatility and a fairly strong dollar. So this has been uh, a net positive for majority of the miners, but um, oh, over, uh, I say net positive, net positive, because <laughs> again, the strong dollar also feeds in through lower commodity prices all because all things being equal a stronger dollar means weaker commodity prices uh, so the net impact of that right is what you want to be considering so it's um it's not super straightforward but it is nevertheless an easy to understand conceptually process right so it's looking out for uh currency uh energy pricing and also uh, labor, pro, labor pro, costs those three main things are costs. those yeah those um, are the main three things the um, in terms of equipment manufacturers, just very briefly, right? Is there a good time to own them? Yes, absolutely. When everybody's mm. building mines, that's when you want to own them because it takes a long time to build mines. People buy equipment all the time uh, and it'll be a while until the, the effect of all these new mines will, fed, will feed through to the production. Mm. So uh, th th there is a good time for that. But again, that's mostly non-gold stuff, right? I mean, gold is such yeah. a small... Uh, um, market relative to uh, to the bigger mines and like even just size wise right I mean uh, you know you're dealing with billions of tons in iron ore right and then you're dealing with ounces in gold right so <laughs> like the, the, you know just even logically the, now again you know gold content is quite low and you actually do need to move quite a lot of earth uh, as well to, to get it out or build a fairly sophisticated underground mine but nevertheless right uh, you know still right, the volume is uh, much much it's, much bigger with uh, iron ore because because you did man good i'm great uh, that you mentioned uh, you brought up about the um uh, machinery guys and all that and it's like, is there a good tracking mechanism for uh, capex cycles for gold mines? I mean, is it readily published? Is it easy to find? Or well, based on I do my own 
I, I just literally add up all the capex numbers for the uh, companies that I follow, and then uh, and then capex plans because they they tend mm. to announce them uh, a bit in advance, and uh, map them out. Right? It's not yeah, super. It, it's in labor intensive, but not uh, super labor intensive. Especially if you have like a terminal of some kind, either a ticker or a Bloomberg. Right? You can yeah. uh, get access to the data. Isn't yeah, it'd be not it'd be, easily, yeah, it'd be interesting but, uh, because you can see like like what we've discussed throughout this podcast about historical trends about. Mm. Even though that you know technology has advanced and you get better yields and all this kind of thing, but the lower quality gold and then all that kind of uh, variables that come into play, you know, it'll be interesting to see like per square, let's say per square kilometer, based on the grade of the mine, how much they can mine and the yield and things like that. That would be very interesting. So I've got probably two final questions, uh, uh, Leo. Um, one is mm. probably about the bankability of projects or the financing of projects for gold mines today now even with esg teams uh, mm. i mean obviously the bad boy in town is still hydrocarbons you know there's mm. gold fall does gold get a better treatment in in your, your your perspective in terms of financing and 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 um, you know uh, getting loans yes i think the shorthand answer is yes uh the slightly longer answer is um I am a consultant to a um, hydrocarbon project, and believe me, that's nothing but a pain and uh, <laughs> all over, really. Uh, you know, moving forward with any financing initiative is, is really difficult, right? I mean, banks don't want to work on hydrocarbons, and uh, the industry is trying to take advantage of smaller players, right? Uh, mm. Because what? Why wouldn't they, right? If you don't have uh, issues with access to capital, by all means use that leverage to uh, squeeze uh, sort of smaller producers. Now, of course, equity markets have always been a, a go-to funding mechanism for startup mines and startup uh, uh, producers of things. Uh, and it's likely to remain so, but the cost of equity is quite high, right? And so, you know, one ought to be aware of that. Um, for the gold mines, I think of all the commodities, it's still probably the easiest to get financing for yeah. again mm. just your output is bankable right i mean it's easier for people to be okay with whatever it is that you're doing if the old result of it is well uh, almost as good as money right um now the one thing i will say is that no matter what you are still running into nimbyism in a lot of developed um, geographies nimby mm. being not in my backyard um yeah. nobody wants to permit the mine no matter how uh low the impact is and again gold mines are not the worst offenders and gold mines are not at the top of the list of things that are hard to permit but mining mm -hmm. permitting in general has been um challenging uh, now again depends on where you are and um in russia for example uh getting permits for mines is not challenging at all right I mean, so um i uh helped uh, a uh gold mining uh junior there and uh, we had a good time right mm -hmm. easy enough and uh uh i say helped i you know okay offered my opinions i should say <laughs> uh, <laughs> they uh, uh there is absolutely uh a different kind of uh issue with uh permits right it's corruption and things like that that you need to be aware of not uh, not, not outright lack of permits but uh, yeah i suppose it's a different conversation yeah so probably the last question and it's uh, i know it's a bit uh, speculative in nature but at the current um elevated prices of gold uh probably what would be the factors that you will see to see that probably the next decline or do you do you see that there's further strengths in you know uh going up even further in terms of prices um Again, I think um, the driving factor will be uh, inflation, right? I mean, I actually happen to think that inflation is going to be, is not going back to like zero to 2% range. And so it's likely to stay somewhat elevated. And there might be another big spike uh, along the way, right? Mm. I am not 
you know, I'm not calling for, you know, whatever, 10% a month sort of stuff until, uh, you know, until we drop kind of thing, right? I'm not calling for another Weimar Republic or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. But I, I do think the inflation is likely to stay elevated. And as this uh, filters through, the, um, mm -hmm. the gold price is likely to trickle up. Right? Uh, again, uh, I think the fact that it touched an all-time high recently is a healthy sign, right? I mean, now it pulled back very considerably quickly, right? I mean, but uh, I, I think the direction for it over the next year or so is slowly trending up, right? And there will mm. be a time where um there will be a time where uh we may wake up to like a hundred to hundred dollar move in gold uh at some point but i don't think it's a regional contract that uh get, gets us there it's it has to be bigger it has to be like a us china related thing that uh, uh you know something basically going back to that original notion of whether gold offers you protection and what it is a protection from um well it's protection from like a big world conflict maybe in that case uh you will be justified in holding like a big, big chunk of gold but even the likelihood of that conflict increasing uh, meaningfully uh, mm -hmm. would like be supportive to the price yeah yeah and no, i think i think that that's a great um you know um foundational uh conclusion to whatever we discuss i mean obviously i started off thinking about it as a commodities episode but you know as you rightly pointed out just being goal alone is already quite uh technically quite challenging to contain in one mm -hmm. episode so um i look forward to you know um subsequent episodes that we talk about other commodities markets you know uh, things like precious metal you know uh, but we took this opportunity leo and i because uh what, what leo saw as the elevated gold prices um, Leo, uh, probably one, one I, I did promise one last question just now, but probably one, one last question for this. In terms of the commodities market in general going forward, where, where do you see it going? Is it going to be more fragmented where upstarts, you know, or, or in, the, in the oil world, hydrocarbon world, we call rednecks, you know, coming up? Mm -hmm. Or do you see more of a consolidation of the industry because of high capex costs? High barriers to entry in the in this industry and maybe you can conclude with a, more of a goal example than anything else well uh, i think we we're seeing uh kind of <laughs> it's neither basically right i think uh, big players will try to grow but that growth is not going to be just focused on gold right i mean uh zijin is a big chinese uh gold miner is no longer a gold miner it's a copper company with a big gold operation right um Evolution is a big Australian miner. Again, uh, just bought a big copper project of CMOC, uh, China Mole, um, and, and, and is moving into this gold copper direction, right? So mm -hmm. it's hard to get scale and gold alone. So the way to grow as a miner is to become a multi uh, metal uh, producer, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. um, now, I understand. Uh, you know, obviously, your new ones, your barracks, are big uh, gold producers, right? So it's not impossible to build, uh, you know, just a gold player. Like, like uh, you know, uh, I think Barrick is 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 a, is a gold standard there. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, there is obviously a uh, business model that is there, but it's just one big producer. Mm. For others there aren't enough quality scalable projects that focus on gold alone and then you have to go into copper gold or gold copper or mm. uh, other things basically I'm, and so I'm, as you expand your metals palette right you kind of slowly expand scale as well it's just at some point you have to be very careful with how you grow because at some point you just look at a remote location you think ah this actually looks quite nice let's go do that and it's got mm -hmm. no scalability to you and no uh benefit to you because it's so far away and so hard to manage and then people tend to get bogged down and developing something like that but uh you know there aren't enough really high quality gold projects out there for everyone so growth will have, will have to be bought in other metals but especially if you think about the dynamic in green energy right does green energy require more gold not really right i mean mm -hmm. but 
require a lot more copper, a lot more aluminium, a lot more silver and things like that. And if we believe that this greenification will continue for better or for worse in some cases, um, then industrial metal demand dynamic is going to be much more healthy, right? I mean, yep. it's going to have a lot more growth in these things, right? And uh, now with industrial metals, there is the fact that you don't quite know which metal is, is going to be in the end because of substitution, right? Because you can actually switch away uh, between metals. Uh, and uh, there's also thrifting. So over a fairly short period of time, we've seen like the intensity, metal intensity drop quite considerably in say electric vehicle manufacturing, things like that. But nevertheless, the uh, vector is very much up and to the right in terms of uh, copper usage and production, aluminium usage and production. We do not see that in gold because again, because of lack of practical implications, right? And I do not consider investor demand to be practical implication. Yeah. <laughs> from, from an investor point of view, of course, it's very practical, all right? I mean, you yeah. take it. Of it. Is there anything more practical than that? Uh, yeah. But I'm talking purely about industrial demand and in the added value industrial demand. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The great, great. Uh, I so I'm looking as I said earlier. I'm looking forward to when we have a specific co uh, commodities discussion. Especially, I, I'm look forward to one where we talk about more of the evolution of EV, where we talk about lithium, where we talk about palladium and nickel and all that and the evolution. But uh, for gold, you know, um, thank you again. Thank you so much, Leo, uh, Leonid, for being on the show. Uh, always appreciate your insights about gold. Uh, for the audience out there, if you've picked up some of the companies that, you know, Leo, it's definitely not a buy or sell call, right, Leonid? <laughs> uh, yes. We may have positions in the names of companies mentioned and none of the things that I that today is a recommendation to buy or sell and it's <laughs> not a recommendation uh, neither from the Pakat Capital Management nor me personally. It's just yeah. my point of view and it may not be shared by my employer. Uh, yeah. yeah. Please, uh, you know, investing has risk. Please consult with a financial advisor before doing anything in the markets. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, I like Terry Smith's way of, uh, you know, putting it, you know, Terry Smith, the the the, the, mm. the fund manager, he just says, fund Smith, yeah. The disclaimer. yeah, he just says, um, he just says that you should be smart enough to discern what I said and whatever, uh, what I say doesn't matter. <laughs> so <laughs> something <laughs> along that line. So uh, DYOR, do your own research and, you know, hopefully you guys have gotten uh, something as I have from, from this episode. Leo, thank you so much. Looking forward to seeing you in the next episode. So, John, uh, like, let's do the next in, in Kiel or Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, definitely. You know, yeah, I, and and Kristen, you know. So, so right. for the audience out there, uh, thank you so much for listening through. If you like content like this, uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the uh, like button, hit the notification bell, so you'll be notified when the next episode is out. And I'll see you guys in the next video.